Great, should I start? Yep. Perfect. So, hi everyone. Uh, I hope you're all doing well this evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. My name is Arthi Kazimum. I am a graduate of Duke University in biology and global health and undergrad. I'm currently a Master of Science and Global Health candidate at Duke Global Health Institute in the same lab as SID, the Global Emergency Medicine Innovation and Implementation or Gemini Lab. My primary interest is in pediatrics, so it's great to hear that others in the group are interested in that as well. And I'm particularly interested in preventing mental health and injury at a health systems level. So my thesis project, which I'll describe um, when I share my slides uh, shortly in the presentation, focuses on understanding and mapping um, time sensitive, preventable and common um, pediatric conditions in low and middle income countries. So in order to identify these important pediatric conditions, I'm surveying um, physicians with medical degrees in India, Tanzania, and Brazil, three primary sites our lab works in, to understand input on how time-sensitive, preventable, and common each of about 65 different sets of conditions spanning from infectious to non-communicable to injury-related are in particular clinics. So in order to assess the distribution of all of these ratings across these three countries and come up with a finalized list, um, I'm utilizing a modified Delphi model. So the current presentation I'll show in a second will describe an overview of the Delphi and modified Delphi process, including its history and its um, layout, and provide a few examples of other common methods that are used to understand and also obtain consensus among survey participants. Um, with that being said, I'll share my slides, and I think my talk will be about 40 minutes. Is that okay? Perfect. All right, I'll share my screen. Hopefully this works. Can you all see this? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Present. Great. So here's a bit more detail on what the presentation will consist of. We'll cover the Delphi model and examples of modified Delphi processes, one of which is the RAM, the RAM UCLA appropriateness method. Um, I'll describe the process and the history of the RAM and then talk about how this framework differs from two others, being nominal group technique or a consensus development conference. Then we'll talk about some published literature on the frequency of the use of the Delphi model over the past couple of decades and appropriateness and examples of how it can be used for emergency medical conditions, which is my particular project. This feeds in nicely into my thesis. So I'll describe my application of the Delphi to my research question and where we are currently in the process and how um, physicians like you all can all get involved to help us further the body of knowledge on pediatric emergency sensitive conditions in low and middle income countries. So first, the Delphi and examples of its use. The Delphi model slash method slash technique, kind of known as all three, was originally developed in the 1950s by Helmer and Dalkey of the Rand Corporation. The name refers back to the Oracle of Delphi, a priestess at a temple of Apollo in ancient Greece who was known for her prophecies. Um, the method was developed originally at the beginning of the Cold War to actually forecast the impact of technology on warfare and the military. Um, in 1944, a general ordered the creation of a report for the Army Air Corps on um, different technological capabilities that could be used by the military. And that team tried a variety of different approaches, um, such as quantitative models and trend extrapolation, and found that um, they had a lot of shortcomings. And so in that regard, they developed the Delphi model um, instead. So the Delphi method assumes that group judgments of a variety of panelists, and including experts in other fields or even clinicians, are more valid than individual judgments. And as I mentioned, it was developed as a forecasting method that consists of opinions of a panel of experts. So forecasting is a technique that uses historical data as inputs to make informed estimates that are then uh, able to be used to predict the future direction of trends originally for technology and warfare, but also things like uh, policy making and, and others. So the Delphi method consists of two or more rounds of one questionnaire. After each round, the facilitator of the study provides an anonymized summary of the responses uh, of that round with different reasons for those if those are collected and experts on the panel after that round are encouraged to revise their earlier answers in second and further rounds. This iterative process is believed to allow convergence towards a correct answer 
And this iteration, iterative process is stopped after a certain um, predetermined stop criterion is met. So this can be something like the mean or median final round scores for each um, item on the survey being a certain level. The Delphi method is also now known as the estimate talk estimate technique, ETE, because there are different rounds of a survey that allow different estimates. And in between, there are the discussion and um, responses being sent back and kind of summarized. So that's the talk component. Next slide. OK, so as I mentioned, the Delphi method consists of a panel of experts that um, are assessed from both within the organization creating it as well as outside. Participants generally remain anonymous, and there is no face-to-face -face discussion amongst the panelists, um, either during or within those survey rounds. It's been used in technology and business forecasting, but also policy making and even developing reporting guidelines. So things like um, public policy issues, economic trends, um, business forecasting, uh, multi-stakeholder approaches for, for participative policy making, and even um, has been used in about 30% of different reporting guidelines that have been developed um, and has been shown to have high inner rater reliability. And there are a couple of strengths and a couple of weaknesses to the Delphi method, as there are to basically anything in the world. And we'll cover more of these later on, but just a couple right now. The Delphi seeks to aggregate opinions from a diverse set of experts from within a field. And it can be done without having to bring everyone together for a physical meeting, which is great, especially now during the pandemic when physical meetings are next to impossible. And since the responses of participants are anonymous, individual panelists don't have to worry about repercussions or judgments on their opinions, so they might be able to be more honest. And consensus can be reached over time over a variety of iterations as opinions are swayed and even changed because each person can see not only their own responses after each round, but an anonymous summary of everyone else's. So those are some strengths, but then there are, of course, some weaknesses. So while it allows for some commentary and some change across um, the different participants and the experts, it will never allow the same sort of kind of lively interaction as a live face to face discussion or even a virtual zoom discussion. A live discussion can sometimes even produce a better um, example of consensus um, and another kind of drawback is that. Uh, for a lot of these surveys, including mine, the survey will take about 30 to one, 30 minutes to one hour to maybe even an hour and a half to complete. A lot of people might take uh, might need to take a lot of time to complete that. So, for example, for my survey, I'm sending it out for round one for a month and then round two for two weeks. So that is about an hour, a month and a half time period. And that might be too long for some studies. For example, if the military is using it and they want it to be done in a faster way to get data um, more efficiently and quickly, the Delphi model might not be for them. So we'll talk about more of that later. Um, but now I want to talk about some modifications to the original Delphi model. Um, and one of one of the uh, pretty well known modifications is the RAM, the RAND UCLA appropriateness method. This was developed about 30 years after the original Delphi in the 1980s to decide the appropriateness of medical or surgical procedures for diagnosis or treatment. It was developed primarily only using expertise of clinicians and researchers in North America and Europe. Um, and um, there was a large manual of how to use it. So there are a couple of differences between the RAM, uh, which we'll talk about in a couple of slides following, and the original Delphi. So while the original Delphi um, has a variety of iterations until con opinions converge, as I mentioned, the RAM iterates until there are no further substantial changes in replies. And instead of the object of the original Delphi being to obtain consensus amongst that large panel, the RAM is usually just used to detect when and in which cases experts agree, rather than force consensus amongst everybody. The RAM does allow panelists to discuss judgments between rating rounds, unlike the original Delphi model. So I talked about the RAM. What is it? So as I mentioned, it was developed in the 1980s. Um, it provides a method of indicating and identifying where and in which cases care is overused, underused, and appropriate, which is necessary to ensure the efficiency and equitability of different healthcare delivery systems, right? So the RAM's definition by RAND and UCLA of appropriateness is one that refers to both the benefits and the harms of a medical or surgical intervention. It was originally used to retrospectively measure the proportion of procedures that were done for inappropriate reasons. So that would be to measure the overuse of procedures that were done in the past. But it has been increasingly used in a prospective fashion to develop different types of clinical decision aids and understand the necessity of different procedures. 
So the figure on the right kind of gives an, a diagram of a nice diagram of how the RAM works. But first, a detailed literature review is performed to synthesize scientific evidence on the procedure to be rated. And at the same time, in parallel, a list of different clinical scenarios called indications is produced, which categorizes patients who might present for the procedure based on their medical history, their symptoms, and diagnostic tests. So for example, um, a patient with severe angina is one example of an indication, and that indication could be compared against a procedure of coronary revascularization. So for that procedure, the entire survey could consist of 50 to 60 indications that would all be rated on their appropriateness as being um, helped, um, the benefit uh, outweighing the harm um, that, would, uh, that would occur based on that uh, coronary revascularization procedure. So. After the literature review and indication list is created, um, a panel of experts is identified to review all of that. And as I mentioned, benefits and harms are taken into account. Each of those experts rate the benefit to harm ratio of the procedure for that specific condition out of that list on a scale of one to nine twice. The first time they rate them at home or wherever they are without panelist interaction. And the second time the panelists do meet for one to two days with a moderator to review their first round ratings, um, as well as the anonymized summary of everyone else's ratings to discuss, modify the original list as necessary and re-rate conditions. The group facilitator, who is quite important, selects the group of experts based on the topic that they want to examine. And after they talk, after the participants are confirmed, each member of that expert panel is then sent the survey with instructions to uh, complete uh, based on their personal opinion, their experience, and or their previous research. So after discussing each chapter of the list of indications, they will re-rate each condition individually. No attempt is made to force the panel to consensus, and instead, um, the two-round process is designed to sort out whether discrepant ratings between the panelists are due to real clinical disagreement, or if it's just due to fatigue or misunderstanding of the question, which would be artifactual disagreement. Each indication is classified as appropriate, uncertain, or inappropriate for the procedure under review in accordance with the median score and level of disagreement amongst the panelists. So for indications with median scores, one to three range, being that the harms greatly outweigh the benefits, the uh, procedure is rated as inappropriate for that condition. For scores of four to six, or all indications that have disagreement, being things that are um, polarized across the group or spread out across the entire one to nine scale, even if the median score is, um, is four to six, if there is that kind of um, uncertainty or uh, diverse distribution, the condition is considered as uncertain for that procedure. However, if the median scores are between seven to nine and there is no disagreement really, then the condition is deemed as appropriate for the procedure in question. So this is usually done through the two round approach that I discussed. Sometimes a third round is used to develop different um, specified criteria like necessity criteria, um, but usually uh, two rounds are, are enough. So now the Delphi model versus the two other things that I mentioned earlier. Um, the Delphi process, one more quick summary involves um, designing a questionnaire, inviting your expert participants, sending out the first round of a survey and analyzing those responses, and then preparing, sending out and analyzing second round responses, third round if necessary, and then reporting your overall findings. Now the members are part of RAND, and this is regarded as an exploratory and detailed procedure with participants remaining anonymous and can, sharing, can share feedback without any discretion or judgment. So nominal group technique, Excuse me, sorry, uh, before we move on to that, other main points to Delphi are, as I mentioned, anonymity, but also the regular feedback um, from the facilitator back to the participants with the um, anonymized responses and how everyone did, but also regular feedback from the expert panel back to the facilitator, because after every round, they do give the survey response back. And the role of the facilitator is very important in designing the research question and keeping the process moving. Now we'll move on to the other two things. So nominal group technique is quite different from the Delphi model, but it's essentially a small group discussion that is designed to reach consensus. So after all the team members are briefed about the group objectives and the outputs to be um, ascertained, they generate ideas, record them, discuss them, and then vote upon them. And they vote primarily to prioritize the ideas in question. So of a list of, let's say, 25 conditions, they prioritize them and they take five at a time, 
quite often. So on the right, there are the top five that were shown for um, a study regarding a library system. And either they rate each participant rates the importance of those on a scale of one to five, with five most important, one least important, or they assign a point value, as you can see here, um, with borrowing books being most important and an SMS notification being least important. So that's just one other kind of parallel process. So this is discussion based. This is designed to reach consensus, which are two differences from the um, RAM modified Delphi. Another uh, frequent consensus method is the consensus development conference. It was developed by the National Institutes of Health in their consensus development program um, in 1977. And it produces a variety of statements that um, similarly to Delphi kind of interpret the available evidence and literature and then identify um, research gaps and guide future research. So the NIH consensus development program has served as a model for other consensus conferences in other countries. However, this method is not used as often anymore. And on the right side of this slide, you can see that there are kind of three phases to this uh, with the literature review discussions and each delegate at the conference presenting their input and discussing that after the fact. So moving back to the Delphi method, having discussed the Delphi and then two other parallel methods, there are um, strengths and weaknesses as I talked about. So some strengths include that a rapid consensus can be achieved depending on the length of the survey. Participants don't have to be together and they are able to express their own opinions without bias from others. And it's relatively low cost to administer and analyze. And some big uh, benefits are that there's a potential to gain large quantities of data, especially in contexts where data um, is often lacking. However, there are some drawbacks in that the Delphi method does not cope well with wide, wide differences in opinions or changes from one round to the next. So if all participants rate a condition as uh, five, let's say on round one, and then they go back and look at everyone's um, feedback and the next round they rate everything as either a one or they rate it as a nine, um, all conditions be rated as uncertain as with disagreement, right? And it will be very hard to really understand what the final results of that are. In addition, other weaknesses are that the facilitator's view could dominate in the analysis because they are the one running the show. They are the one designing the research question, designing what is, um, what is a good number to stop the study at, fruit survey response, things like that. The Delphi method can also be quite time consuming, especially dependent on how long the survey is. As I mentioned, mine will take about a month and a half, which might be too long for some um, other studies. And other things include that the success of the method overall depends on the quality of the participants. So this, be, this being things like um, how much time they're able to put in, their expert knowledge, their years of experience, and things like that. It needs high participant motivation and time, especially from clinicians who often have no time. Um, that can also kind of delay the process or make it harder to reach um, any idea of consensus. And it is very much in a written format, so it's kind of like a survey, and this format might be less suitable for some respondents who preferred the kind of um, nominal group technique or consensus conference big discussion format. So now moving on to the frequency of the use of this model. Um, I found one paper that is quite old and it talked about um, the frequency of the Delphi method in social science research. So you can see that there are a variety of databases here in different periods from 95 to 99 and 2000, 2004, that shows the frequency of different Delphi articles and then Delphi dissertations and theses like mine that were published. And in terms of Delphi articles, in pretty much all databases across all of these 10 periods, um, barring one or two, there were about 100. And dissertations and theses were also in quite high numbers as well. I wasn't able to find more recent data than this, um, but uh, we'll definitely keep looking and can, can share um, some updates as well if I'm able to find anything. So the appropriateness of the Delphi for emergency medical conditions. One paper that I am heavily modeling my study off of is by Anita Vashi et al. in 2019 published in JAMA. And their team used the modified Delphi similar to RAM, but also with some other modifications to um, understand emergency care sensitive conditions. So these are conditions for which timely access to high quality emergency care is associated with morbidity and mortality. And using that, they were trying to identify the characteristics of emergency department, emergency department visits for those conditions. So their expert panel consisted of those from emergency medicine, but also primary care and hospitalists to identify different condition groups as emergency care sensitive. 
So first, they, following the original Delphi, um, created an initial list of conditions by their International Classification of Disease 10 code based on the literature. Two physicians from their team reviewed those codes and made different exclusions as they saw fit and aggregated them into condition groups that made it easier for um, the um, expert clinicians to rate. Panelists were asked for the average patient with each of these conditions, to what extent does timely emergency care affect subsequent mortality, and then in parallel, morbidity. And panelists responded with the rating from one being there's no little impact, um, and not, to nine being there's strong impact. So the range of one to three was kind of no to little, four to six was intermediate or moder uh, moderate, and then seven to nine was relatively strong. So here is kind of the study diagram of what they did. They identified the categories, they excluded a couple, uh, particularly they excluded pediatric, chronic, or subacute conditions just based on um, the number of people in their expert panel and them not coming from pediatric or um, chronic condition backgrounds. And um, they wanted to also limit the scope of their study. And so they made these exclusions as such. They organized these conditions into different groups. And you can see after the first round of rating, uh, some were rated as seven to nine without disagreement, some as one to four without disagreement, and then some as either with disagreement or between four um, or seven. Then the panelists suggested some condition groups based on their own expertise, so things related to alcohol, opiates, and UTI, and those were discussed um, through a teleconference, which is not something that I'll be doing, but that is something that, um, that's a modification that Vashi et al. made to the original Delphi. And after the second round of rating, um, you can see there are 51, uh, seven to nine rating without disagreement, um, seven is one to four without disagreement, and then 28 in between, with differences across mortality and morbidity. So how does it relate to my thesis? Um, the rest of the presentation will kind of focus on what I'm doing, what I need your help with, and if we have any time, go into some other examples. So a background is that emergency medical care is often one of the weakest components of low and middle income country um, health systems. And emergency and critical care is described as all care given in a hospital setting with patient, to patients with sudden serious reversible disease. Children, particularly arriving at LMIC hospitals with emergency conditions, require but frequently do not receive effective and timely identification, prioritization, and treatment, with 50% of pediatric hospital deaths occurring within 24 hours of admissions. LMIC settings also exhibit high under five mortality per 1,000 live births, for example, Brazil at 13.9, India at 34.3, and Tanzania at 50.3. This is due in part both to individual hospital level treatment and physician availability, but also a systems level lack of resources. Tools to assess the quality of hospital care provision have been implemented in LMICs to assess and mitigate population level mortality. So there are two lists that have been created um, to kind of assess health systems at that level. One was ambulatory care sensitive conditions, ACSCs, and the other as emergency care sensitive conditions, which we just talked about with Fashi's paper or ECSCs. And they have been defined and described as measures of primary and emergency care quality, respectively. So first proposed by Carr et al. in 2010, ECSCs are defined as conditions for which rapid diagnosis and early intervention in acute illness or acutely decompensated chronic illness improve patient outcomes. They serve as a framework to build and improve emergency quality delivery systems. They were adapted from the framework of ambulatory care sensitive conditions, which are conditions for which good outpatient care or early intervention can prevent hospitalization need or severe complications. The concept of ECSCs, as described by Carr, identify conditions essential to improving outcomes by both clinicians as well as hospital administrators, and it allows accountability at the health system rather than the physician level, and can therefore be used for appropriate risk stratification and triage of patients. So Vashi, who we just talked about, used Carr et al.'s proposed framework in one of the first studies on ECSC-associated visits. It was focused on adults 18 plus, um, coming into the hospital with different ICD-10 diagnostic codes in the United States um, found with state-level inpatient and emergency department databases. 
ED visits were classified as emergency care sensitive conditions if they were um, rated as highly sensitive to emergency care by that expert panel. And their overall study does propose a comprehensive list to be used in developing emergency care quality measures. However, I've noticed some gaps in this. Authors did not include, as I mentioned, pediatric or mental health conditions due to those requiring additional expertise. And, <coughs> excuse me, due to their use of only United States data, do not consider the global distribution and burden of such emergency conditions in LMICs. In Brazil, a country with high under five and infant mortality rates, many pediatric hospitalizations occur due to avoidable causes, ACSCs. But we found no studies to propose a list of pre pediatric preventable conditions that expand upon ACSCs or conduct a data-driven approach by clinician overview to determine how common preventable or time-sensitive pediatric emergency presentations are in, L in LMIC countries. So in order to identify, improve, and ensure timely triage, diagnosis, and treatment for global pediatric cases, the identification of conditions that are most common, sensitive, and preventable in LMIC settings like Brazil, India, and Tanzania is imperative. So my study design is a two-pronged approach. So first, uh, I selected preventable and time-sensitive ICD-10 codes via literature review. I scoured the literature to find different studies on the epidemiology of pediatric conditions in hospitals and in emergency settings. I found studies in Mozambique, in India, and in Ethiopia, and others, and compiled that into a list that I gave to a couple of clinicians in our Gemini lab. They reviewed it, and they told me what conditions could be time-sensitive or preventable based on their expertise. So some of them are neonatologists, some of them are adult emergency physicians, some are pediatric emergency physicians. So with all of that, we were able to create a revised list. This list, um, having now received IRB approval, will be compiled into a REDCap survey that will be sent out to clinicians like yourself to uh, complete both in a round one and a round two format. In parallel to getting this data from the Delphi Method survey, I'm doing a data-driven approach from data in Brazil on pediatric hospitalizations. So this tells me how common different conditions are um, across different age ranges, less than one, um, one to five, five to 12, and 13 to 18, across various gender um, and across year from 2015 to 2020. And using both of these approaches, I intend to do a comparison and geospatial analysis. So some things I'm interested in, and I would appreciate any and all feedback you have on this that you think um, should be added is what is common via the data in Brazil versus what is common via the survey data from Brazil, India, and Tanzania? What can we find from sub-analyses by different age ranges, year, and gender for kids? What is the percentage of hospitalizations that we found in Brazil that are preventable versus time sensitive? How does this differ by region? And then what is the distribution of preventable time sensitive or common conditions of Brazil hospitalizations? We can use that to understand access to care via transportation distance and hospital location calculations. So here's one example of a literature that was uh, compiled. I won't make you read all of this, but it's just to give an, an understanding of what we did. So for example, Mozambique, Pakistan, Ethiopia, here are the different conditions that were indicated in those studies based on, uh, excuse me, also attached to their prevalence in the study. So all of these were compiled and this is what the survey will look like. So uh, would you, you would consent to participating in the survey. The only identifying info you would give is your email because I do need to contact you and I do need to contact you again with the anonymized responses and you need to complete the survey again. But other than that, I'm not collecting any identifiable information. I'm only going to ask you about your role, your experience, your specialty. And your Did we lose her? I guess so. Okay. Hmm. Let's wait for maybe like a minute. Yeah, I'll just All type it in the chat box. I think she'll be back.
Guys, in the meantime, if you all have questions, you all can just start typing on the chat box so we make it quicker. Yes, most definitely. Also, like the the study that she is talking about, it would be amazing if if like the people, like all the medicine folks in Asar, could participate in that. That might be a good experience for you and and a lot of help for her. Atmika, we should pause the recording. By the way, shut down. So I will. Um, I'll just continue where I left off. Sorry about that. Share my screen again. Not what I meant to present. Okie dokie, where were we? So this is the survey that will be sent out, essentially asking your consent, some um, details about your position and things. And then the real meat of the survey is assessing to which degree is the following condition, which um, the condition list will be on the following slides. Um, to which degree is it time sensitive, preventable or common on a scale of one to nine? following the same scaling system as Vashi et al. And then um, the unique spin I'm adding is, are any of these common or any of these specific to only different age ranges? So for example, um, time sensitive at only less than five years. And are any of these specific to only certain conditions? So for example, only in cases of prematurity. So here are the list of conditions um, split up into different categories and organized from infectious to uh, chronic non-communicable then to injury. So you'll notice a couple of these conditions are split up into sub questions. So things like anemia. Anemia itself is not necessarily a disorder. It's more of a symptom of, and it can be a symptom of a couple of things. The clinicians in your group would know much more than me on this, but um, the clinicians in our team indicated that we should ask about anemia as a symptom of uh, disorder of producing red blood cells or lysis of blood cells or blood loss. So for example, some of these are split up in that way. You'll also notice some of the conditions are grouped together. So we figured that assessing about um, all eye conditions or ear conditions overall might be easier, uh, both time-wise and understanding-wise and asking you all about otitis media, externa, mastoiditis, and other related things. So those are some kind of modifications from the original disease names. Um, here's moving on to some of the non-communicable injury-related ones. So things like uh, MI, gallbladder disease, et cetera. Jaundice is also split up into two different symptoms. And then injuries are all grouped together, but each of these will be asked about separately from fall all the way to traumatic brain injury. And this is where clinicians with medical degrees in your group come in from all specialties, experience, backgrounds, and interest levels to help contextualize and provide expertise as to the sensitivity, preventability, and commonality of certain conditions in your setting within India. So my modified Delphi builds off of the one that was proposed by Vashi et al. that we discussed earlier in the presentation and seeks to understand not just, uh, it seeks to not obtain consensus. It seeks to understand how opinions differ across settings within and between countries. And we hope that this method can be applied to other settings as well with the survey modified to best suit future research questions. So this is the uh, consent information, um, which will be, the email will be sent out by Sid and I's PI, Dr. Rob Sasi, to anyone here who is interested. And um, at the end of the presentation will be my email. And if you have any further questions later or happy to take any questions right now. So I'll briefly talk about some other examples of the Delphi model in emergency and surgery, and then move on to any questions you have, I found these quite interesting. So one in particular used it to establish a research agenda for an emergency severity index. So they um, used three rounds of data collection to assess uh, different questions um, within different categories, such as education and training and workplace and emergency care services to understand um, different, uh, excuse me, to, to understand the emergency severity index um, uh, for emergency triage nurses. And then one more example is, uh, this is a systematic review actually, which I found very interesting. So they did an SR to um, examine the use of the Delphi method in developing guidance for emergency nursing practice. So 
here are just a couple of many, many studies that use the Delphi method on emergency related topics. And I've used some of this information to develop the literature review and design for my own study. So I can also link the paper for this if anyone is interested. So that is my presentation. Thank you for bearing with my technological difficulties and listening. Um, happy to take any questions or clarifications or just listen to your all's expertise. You are the clinicians and happy to get any um, information from you as well. So thank you. Well, thanks, Aarti. That was that was wonderful and really comprehensive. Um, okay, we'll, we'll we'll start with the questions if that's all right with you. Um, so, does anybody want to go ahead? I I can start. Um, so my question is like it's two part. Uh, first, um, does the, the do the panelists have to be experts and how do you define the expertise of how do you define uh, what kind of panelists you take up? Like the expert, basically, how do you define that they're experts or they're not? Like, that's one of my questions. And the second question is that um, so one of the limitations I noticed was uh, the that it's really difficult to investigate why there is differing opinion or a differing answer in the second round. Mm. Uh, is that something that you are doing in your study? Will you be investigating why as to why the panelists change their answers in the second round? Is that something that you would be interested in? Mm. Okay. Both really interesting questions. Thank you. So for the first um, regarding who is an expert and who kind of determines that, that I could not find any literature that really specified that besides saying that the facilitator is the one who decides who is an a quote unquote expert. I don't think you need to be in any way like the top of your field, but just have expertise or experience in what's being assessed. So for me, it's any clinician who practices, regardless of whether you have 20 plus years or two plus years of experience. So that is just up to me and to um, Joao and others in our team. I don't think that there is um, kind of any set metric for who is an expert, but I could be wrong. And then regarding your second question about um, their it, the Delphi model kind of uh, falls apart if there are big differences from round one to round two. How am I um, assessing that or understanding that? That is a good question. So I, I am trying to do that by adding those free text boxes of um, or any of these specific to different ages or specific to different contexts, because if someone rates something as a five but notes one context and someone rates something as a three but notes a different context, that might be a way for us to um, understand what the difference is. As of now, we don't have um, any set protocol for actually reaching back out to the clinicians and getting input from them as to why they noted that or getting their um, expertise on what the difference is. That is something that we are thinking about adding to the IRB protocol if we do see um, a lot of differences between round one and round two, or even a wide variety of responses in round one across the settings. Um, given that this is an exempt study and we're not collecting any um, any real identifying data or any patient data, um, we should be able to add that to the study as necessary later, but figured um, as of now, just to kind of get it rolling, we wouldn't add it at the beginning. I hope that answers your questions. That does, thanks. Mm -hmm. that does. thanks. Um, all right, anybody else who wants to go ahead and ask any questions? I had a quick question. Is there like a sample size requirement for Delphi study? like a Delphi panel and yeah. also also like a what's kind of the ideal adherence rate between two rounds like how how, how many people would you like to retain between like two or three rounds mm -hmm. okay so in terms of sample size literature has said that um, this depends on the diversity of expertise of the panelists. So if you have everyone from a similar background, like same type of clinicians, you can have about five to seven, which is kind of what Bashi et al. did. But if you have ones from a variety of um, specialties, so for example, what I'm doing is asking anybody who's willing to answer, um, that um, I believe requires a minimum of about 20 people. But there isn't um, any set minimum or maximum, it's just kind of a couple of people postulating that these are good numbers based on their own um, studies. And um, adherence rate, 
hopefully everybody who finishes this first round will also finish the second round. I don't really have a backup plan, I guess, if you don't, besides just hounding you to get you to do it. Um, but I'm hoping that adherence will be improved through a couple of things. So I'm giving one month to finish the first round and two weeks for the second round. So this, the survey will be the same from round one to round two. If anything, only a couple of conditions will be added or removed, depending on what you all think is necessary. So it should be uh, hopefully easier to complete it the second time around and not take you a full two weeks to do it. Um, so that's one thing. And then two, I will be sending multiple reminders throughout the course of the study. So within the first month, two or three reminders and the second two weeks, uh, two reminders. I know that you're all very busy. Um, and if there are a couple of people who don't complete second round, then I will have to discuss with Joao and, and others to figure out what to do about it. Just a follow up question towards it. like how many do you become? Uh, so I'm assuming that you want uh, clinicians or med people associated with medical from our organization yes. as well to take part in the Delphi. Yes. How many are you expecting? Uh, is that uh, like from the organization? And is there some kind of uh, any inclusion exclusion criteria that you've set for your yeah. study? For, for your study, yeah. So we are trying to recruit a maximum of 35 clinicians from all three settings. So as many from your group who are interested, the better. If it ends up being more than 35 people, I will just send that to the IRB and ask for that to be amended. So um, really there is no uh, set maximum or minimum, just depending on who is willing to put in the time. Um, so did you have another question? I asked if what, what's the inclusion then? Oh, right, right. So, yes, thank you for repeating it. So inclusion is just anyone with a medical degree, so M MD, DO, MBBS, anything equivalent, um, who does practice in India. That's it. You can right. be of any specialty, any location really within India, any um, uh, experience year. Yeah, really hoping to just get a diverse set of people here. Sounds good. Uh, so, you know, uh, so how do you usually contact these people? I mean, you've gotten in touch with us. So similarly, in different countries, how do you usually get hold of people to do your, to help you out? Yeah, so our group, as I mentioned, works primarily in Tanzania and Brazil. So we have two PIs, Catherine Staten and Joao Vasasi. Catherine does the majority of her work in Tanzania, and we have quite a few collaborators there. And then Joao is native to Brazil, does a lot of work in Brazil and has collaborators there. So primarily recruiting from their own um, collaborators and existing partners in different clinical sites in Tanzania and Brazil, and then um, having known Sid and having this great connection to your group, hoping to recruit from you all as well. So definitely more connection-based than, than anything else, but we thought it would be quite hard to distribute this pretty publicly and wait for response, just given how long the survey is and how little time, of course, US clinicians have. Um, so that's kind of the met method for recruitment. Uh, on that, I have like another question, Arti. Mm -hmm. What's the typical length of a Delphi survey? That's a good question. I haven't found a typical length. For clinical studies, it seems the typical time limit seems to be about one hour to one and a half hours to complete. For like technology studies, it seems to be more like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, because there are just fewer things to assess. Um, but there isn't a set item kind of requirement or general idea. But I will look into that because that's something that I didn't consider. And I can get back to you all. Are there any more questions? I I I can not. Um all right, this was this was great, Arte. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Thanks for giving us your time, and um, I think we keep the chat going on. Uh, mm -hmm. With respect to people who are interested, I'll I'll next edition I would follow up with you on that. So, Desh, would you like to add something? No, 
I think uh, uh, Arti just dropped her Duke email ID, so you mm-hmm. can reach out to her on that. Uh, no, well, thanks Arti for doing this. Uh, I attended like a part of this talk in one of our Gemini meetings, and it was yeah, it was super amazing. So I thought we should have it in uh, Asr as well. Uh, yeah, Arti is like one of the people that I go to when I need to learn things about organizing myself. When I need to learn things about how I plan. uh my life my things better so uh she is she is super organized she is quite amazing she just graduated this year but even then she has had a lot of research experience till now uh and soon she'll be a pediatrician we'll we'll see we'll with that with also maybe a phd so I'm applying to med school this uh, cycle so yeah. said very positive things about me um but yeah I put my duke email in the chat Sid is also amazing and actually provided this connection in the first place without which I would be really um in the in the canoe in the um water without a canoe and a paddle really so thank you so much for being willing to listen to me and being hopefully willing to participate in the study once I have the survey ready um I will recontact Sid and Joao to get it distributed to all of you and we hope to see your responses soon and thank you so much for hoping for helping us um contribute to the field of global pediatrics in this way Thanks Arti. Thanks. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.